Um, will you please extend a hand as we pray for the youth who are being dismissed now to their programs downstairs. I'm going to pray for them as they go. Extend a hand with me, please. God, we pray for our youth as they go um, to learn more about you. May your presence be with them and go with them. May your presence be with their uh, leaders and volunteers. May you bless them. May you reveal yourself to them. May you reveal yourself to us as well. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, good morning. I'm Chris Pan. I am the executive director of the church. And hello to everybody who is here in the sanctuary and everybody online and everybody uh, joining at the Vine with Pastor Tim. Um, they all cheer when I say that. You can't hear it, but they can hear it. So, and I can feel it. I, I can feel it. Um, our sermon title today is How It Ends. Uh, and we are following the lectionary, which is a schedule of readings from the Bible that churches around the world have been following for centuries. And our passage today is from the end of the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 21. A few weeks ago, I preached on a passage from the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, uh, where God speaks and declare that he, declares that he is the God who is and was and is to come, a God outside of time, a God that is present in our present, a God that redeems our past, a God that holds the future. Uh, and today's passage from the end of the book is how it ends. Um, that passage in chapter 1 is the first time God speaks in the book of Revelation. This passage in chapter 21 is the second time that God speaks in the book of Revelation. It's a reminder that whatever God has to say is much more important than what I have to say from this pulpit. So as we go through our sermon today, ask yourself two questions. One, what is God saying to me? And two, what does he want me to do about it? What is God saying to me? What does he want me to do about it? Will you pray with me again? Heavenly Father, we take a deep breath. We come into your presence. We invite your Holy Spirit to transform us. We don't want to be informed. We want to be transformed. We don't want to be informed. We want to be inspired by your Holy Spirit. May you open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. May you speak to us now. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And all God's children say, Amen. A church, uh, church member, a dear church member, emailed me after I preached last time from Revelation, and um, she wrote, when I saw that the passage was going to be from Revelation, I thought, oh, because Revelation is so hard and difficult to understand. Um, and she was very complimentary afterwards, but I get it. Revelation is a weird book. Um, it's got a dragon and from, that comes out of the sea and a beast with the head of a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. Uh, it's full of kind of just strange imagery. And it's important to remember that the Bible is a collection of 66 different books spanning a number of genres, uh, different genres. History and prophecy, poetry, gospel, wisdom, letters. Uh, and none of those genres is modern scientific textbook. And so we shouldn't read it as one. The book of Revelation is a specific type of literature called apocalypse. Uh, apocalyptic literature is something our modern minds um, isn't used to. We think about apocalypse and we think catastrophe, something bad. But apocalypse is actually, the word means actually unveiling. Uh, the title of the last book of the Bible is actually the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The theologian Daryl Johnson says that the book of Revelation is a lifting of the cover, the opening of a door, the revealing of what's behind the curtain. It's literally breaking through from hiddenness. And the author of the book of Revelation, John, he's actually writing a pastoral letter to be passed among these seven ancient churches in what's now modern day Turkey. He's writing to encourage them and give them hope in a world full of uncertainty and turmoil and conflict. Does that world sound familiar? Do you need some encouragement and hope today in a world full of uncertainty and turmoil and conflict? I know I do. John encourages these churches by writing them about his symbolic dreams and visions, revealing and unveiling God's heavenly perspective on our world and two things. One, the unseen realities of the future, and two, the unseen realities of our present. Dale Johnson, once again, writes, things are not as they seem, or more precisely, 
things are not just as they seem. The passage that we're going to be looking at today is from chapter 21. It's about how it ends. And I hope it gives us encouragement and hope as we live in challenging and confusing times, just as it gave the early church encouragement and hope. Uh, Before I read our passage today, first I wanted to talk about the Muppets. Uh, The Muppets. About 10 years ago, when my kids were uh, five and three, we took them to see the movie The Muppets. Uh, And here's a poster for the movie. Um, Those are all the Muppets. And yes, that is six-time Academy Award nominee Amy Adams, next to a hand puppet named Animal that plays the drums. Um, If you missed this cinematic masterpiece, allow me to recap the story for you. Um, An evil businessman named Tex Richman uh, is going to evict the Muppets and destroy the Muppets Theater, unless the Muppets can come up with $10 million. But the Muppets have disbanded by this point in time, and so the movie covers Kermit the Frog and his human friends traveling around, trying to get the gang back together so they can do a telethon in order to raise the funds to save the theater. Kermit goes and visits Fozzie Bear and Gonzo and Animal and Dr. Bunsen Honeydew and his assistant Beaker and of course Miss Piggy who is living in Paris at the time as the editor of Paris Vogue magazine. Uh, Over the course of the movie, the Muppets face numerous challenges and setbacks. They learn valuable lessons and despite all the nefarious schemes of the evil Tex Richmond in the very last scene of the movie, surprise, the Muppets are able to save their theater. Yay. <laughs> uh, why am I telling you about the Muppets? Uh, when we saw this movie, Tex Richmond's plan to evict the Muppets is revealed in the first 10 minutes of the movie. And my five-year-old starts crying because the Muppets are gonna lose their theater. It's the saddest thing this kid has ever seen on film. And my five-year-old continues to cry for the entire duration of the movie. An hour and 20 minutes. The kid's just bawling, inconsolable, because the Muppets are going to lose their theater. My kid's just weeping because my kid doesn't know how the story's going to end. My kid doesn't know that they're watching a kid's movie, and all kid's movies have happy endings. I know that because I am old, and I've seen lots of movies, lots of kid's movies and lots of Muppets movies. And so I can relax and know that it's all going to work out in the end. Knowing how the Muppet movie is going to end changes our experience. Knowing how it's going to end changes our entire experience. Knowing how it's going to end gives us hope for the future. Knowing how it ends allows us to persevere through the hard times in the present. Knowing how it ends gives meaning to the challenges. Knowing how it ends means we don't have to push and plot and scheme so hard. Knowing how it ends puts everything in proper perspective. And no, I am no longer talking about the Muppets movie. Our passage today is from the book of Revelation. This is from the second to last chapter of the very last book of the Bible, How It Ends. If you are able, would you please stand as I read our passage from Revelation today. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. The author John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, behold, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please be seated. 
This is how it ends. This is the glorious picture, hallelujah, of what the end looks like for those who know God. And if we have this picture in mind as we go through all of our days, I think it will change our perspective on how we live in the here and now. It gives us hope for the future and hope for the present. Why does it give us hope? First, let's start with this idea of new. Verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 5, And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Uh, just an aside, if you're all caught up now being like, why is the sea going to disappear? I love the ocean. Um, let me just say that the sea was traditionally thought of as a place of chaos. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was God imposing order upon chaos, and the chaos was um, depicted as the sea. In Revelation 13, that dragon and that beast with the crazy features, that beast comes out, out of the sea. It's a place of evil. And so this passage, when it says the sea will be no more, means there will be no more place of chaos or evil. Let's get to this idea of new. New. I think there's two ways of thinking about things that are new. Um, recently, my wife got a new phone, and last year, we got a new kitchen. Uh, her old phone was five years old, really beat up, wasn't getting security updates, and so she sent her old phone back for a credit, uh, and she got a totally new phone. Totally new and different thing. Old phone gone, replaced by a new phone. That's one type of new, one kind of new. Last year, we got a new kitchen. Or we say we got a new kitchen, but we didn't just rip out our kitchen and ship it off someplace and in that gaping hole drop in a new kitchen from the new kitchen store. Um, we got a new kitchen, but really it was a renovation, a restoration. We restored some old cabinets, put in a hood vent, uh, took out part of a wall. It was a transformation of our old kitchen into something new. When these verses talk about a new heaven and a new earth, making all things new, what kind of new do we think it's talking about? A new phone or a new kitchen? Um, it's the second sense of new, like a renovated kitchen. God is not tossing out this earth and replacing it entirely with something different. This is a promise of a new heaven and a new earth, but it's a restoration, a renovation, a transformation of what is already here. I've shown this slide a few times in previous sermons. I will continue to show this slide. This slide is a grand story of the Bible. It shows the grand story of the Bible of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And the biblical story doesn't just end with redemption and salvation on Easter. And the biblical story doesn't end with replacement or escape. The biblical story the narrative to which all our lives belong, the narrative in which all our lives find meaning, ends with restoration. The restoration and glorious transformation of the world. This is true for the world and this is true for us. The Apostle Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthian church, so if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. In Jesus Christ, we are new meaning transformed and renewed, and not just us. Salvation and transformation isn't just for us as individuals. It's for the whole world and for all of history. I think this is so incredibly important for our perspective on the future and for how we live in the present. Uh, over the last few decades, a theology of the rapture has become popular in American evangelical culture. I'm going to talk about the rapture now. Please don't get mad. <laughs> It is okay to disagree. Reasonable Christians can disagree. After the first service, I had a very good conversation with somebody who disagreed with my points, and I think we can agree. We are still brothers. We are still part of the family of God. And so let me now talk about the rapture. Um, the rapture is found in books and movies like Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth and the Left Behind series. But the rapture was not orthodox theology for the first 1,900 years of the church. Uh, the rapture is never once mentioned in the book of Revelation. I think the idea of the rapture um, is that Christians get taken up out of this world into a heavenly world. And I think the roots of the rapture um, are actually found in Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, not the Bible. Um, in Greek philosophy, the physical was bad and the spiritual was good. And so Greek dualism thought that the culmination of this life would be our spirit floating away from this earthly and transitory and bad world to the heavenly and eternal world. But that's not the Bible. In the Bible, Jesus came 
in the flesh, in a body, to us here. And he was resurrected in a physical body. And he ascended to heaven in a physical body. His body was transformed, and it still had the physical stars from crucifixion. Jesus in heaven comes here. The theologian G.E. Ladd wrote that the Bible, quote, always places man on a redeemed earth, not in a heavenly realm removed from earthly existence. And you can see re this uh, reality in verse 2 of our passage. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The holy city coming down out of heaven. The words of the Lord's Prayer that we prayed earlier. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. The words of the prayer are not, help me escape from this world up into heaven. This is how the theologian Brian Blunt puts it. Instead of believers being raptured up into the heavens, the city of God is lowered down onto the transformed earth. The ratification of the earth as a place of God's engagement and not a place from which to escape cannot be imaged in any stronger terms. Working for the transformation of the earth is important because the transformed earth is where God works even now to establish God's holy city and thus God's eschatological relationship with God's people. Eschatological is just a fancy way of saying relating to the end times. The earth is the place of God's engagement. It's not a place to escape. Working for the transformation of the earth is important because the transformed earth is where God is working even now. It's where God is working to establish his holy city, his relationship with us. Can you see how this one point makes a huge difference in how we as Christians live in this world now? How we engage, interact with our neighbors and our institutions and our planet. If we think we are escaping here, and we can treat God's creation around us, the planet, and the people, like they're disposable, like they're disposable, single use. You can run it into the ground, toss it, and get a replacement. But if indeed the city of God is coming to a transformed earth, then we have to interact with this planet and its people in a very different way. I learned the other day from Pastor Pete Grigg that if we continue with current levels of plastic production and consumption by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. I looked it up, and we are already one-third of the way there. If we're escaping here, that doesn't matter. Uh, but if God's kingdom is to come on a restored earth as it is in heaven, then it matters a lot. I think we have a unique position on this. And I think we, I don't mean Christians or Presbyterians, I think we, I mean we as First Pres Honolulu, because somehow, improbably, miraculously, and somewhat ridiculously, God has given us the gift of 246 acres of conservation land to steward. During service a few weeks ago, I announced uh, our Hakukia, Hakukia Pilina work day. And I was corrected afterwards uh, that it wasn't a work day, it was a restoration day. And that's absolutely correct. Here are some photos. A few weeks back, a number of us got out onto the property and we learned from experts how to restore our property. And in particular, we were managing albizia trees. Albizias are uh, a particularly invasive species on the island that grow 20 feet a year. Uh, they have super shallow roots and incredibly brittle branches. And we have thousands of them on our property. But we learned how to strip the bark on the tree with a simple handsaw, and this will address and remove that invasive tree for good. Uh, there are about 50 of us that day, and in the course of only about an hour and a half, we treated every single albizia around the old 16th fairway. This is the view across the pond. You can see all those barks stripped. Um, we even learned how to manage the massive albizias out there. You can see by the size of this trunk how big this albizia tree is. And it would cost us maybe $40,000 if we wanted to bring in a crew to take that tree down. But in 10 minutes, with just a hatchet and a few drops of herbicide, JC from the Koala Mountain Watershed Project took care of this tree for us for free. I, um, correction? Um, I said for free, and then Jamie Grisbeck um, told me, she said, no, no, actually, it's about $3 worth of herbicide. So he took care of that tree for us, almost for three. Um, this is the second best picture of Restoration Day. 
Um, you can see the, the size of that albizia in the back. It's the huge tree in the back is that tree that was addressed. Uh, in the front with the orange tape is one of the 12 koa trees that we planted. Old, destructive, invasive albizia removed, new, beautiful, native koa tree planted. A picture of making all things new, a picture of restoration. Amen? Amen. But wait, there's more. Because this, that was not the best picture of Restoration Day. This picture coming up, this is the best picture from Restoration Day. You may not love trees, but this is a picture of the people. It's the 40 or 50 of us gathered before we started. And in this group are church members who've been part of this church for more than 20 years. And in this group is a family that literally took their new member of vows the week before. And in this group, there's a couple that had just finished stick six. This was their stick seven. There are kids in this group as young as eight, and there are senior adults who are much older than eight. <laughs> Most encouraging to me was that we were joined that day by people who have nothing to do with First Pres or church. Members of the community around us, an intern from the nonprofit Kupu, volunteers and staff from the Koalau Mountain Watershed Partnership and from the nonprofit Protect and Preserve Hawaii, a grad student in natural resource management from UH, Wimmerd Community College students, a couple who lives in Heia and just saw a social media post and decided to show up. The Restoration Day was called the Pilina Restoration Day. Hakuhi is the name of the property, of our development of the property. Pilina means connected or binded together. I know that there are many who are excited about the possibilities of what will happen out on our property. And I know that there are many that are skeptical about what will, go out, what will happen out on our property. But what gave me great hope that day was the ability to work side by side with our neighbors from the community who are not Christians, who are not part of this church. And they came to our property not to sit in a service on a Sunday morning, but to help us restore the land. We're living in a particularly divisive and politicized time. And I think our task as a church, now more than ever, is to figure out how to communicate and demonstrate God's love for our neighbors and for our island. And that's why that was the best photo. Because the most important part of restoration to me isn't the koa trees. It's the people. Church is not a building that you go to. Church is the people that we are on a journey of faith with. And that day, a whole bunch of new people came to church. And what I heard from them was surprising to me. What I heard from them was gratitude and appreciation. They were so grateful for what we were doing. They were grateful to have the opportunity to be out on our beautiful property. They were grateful that we were addressing invasive species and caring for the Aina. They were grateful we invited them and wanted to work with them. We'll be having Pilina Restoration Days every month, except for June. The next one's going to be on May 28th. Come along. Invite somebody who isn't part of our church to join you. A huge thank you to Kelly Miyamura, and in particular to Jamie Grisbeck, for all of their work in putting these days together these, um, and these partnerships together. I think Restoration Day is a perfect segue, counterintuitive segue, into the next part of our passage, which is the unveiling at the end is a picture of a city. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The big reveal at the end isn't that we get to be in some idyllic field one-on-one -on -one with God. Uh, we're not in some pasture. We're not on some mountaintop. We're not in a spa. The picture is of a city. I don't know how you feel about cities. But cities are inherently social. Cities are full of people. And this picture of the holy city is an ideal of the perfect community. This is not the Garden of Eden replicated again with just Adam and Eve. It is a city, the new heaven and new earth, captured by a city. If you are an introvert like me, I'm sorry. The end is not going to be you sitting alone reading books. It's going to be life lived together in redeemed community. And so we should start getting used to that now. Even more than that, the city is a bride. 
Verse 2 again, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. For her husband. I don't know that many cities that look like a bride. Uh, maybe it's just this one. And why a bride? The holy city could have been described as full of splendor and riches, full of gold streets, overflowing with wealth. But it's not. The holy city could have been described as full of angels bowing down in reverence to its power and prestige. But it's not. What's chosen here isn't wealth or splendor or power or even righteousness. It's a bride. The intimate, tender, loving relationship between a married couple. A bride highlights God's profound love for us. It's like going to a famous athlete's house. And when you walk in, what they're most interested in isn't showing off their fancy house or their fancy cars or all their awards and all their trophies. What they first and most want to do is to introduce you to their spouse. And who is this spouse? Who is this bride? It's us. We get to share in the scene at the end with the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Us. Ordinary people, along with the ordinary people from those original seven churches that John was writing to, somehow, improbably, God chooses us to be his church and to be his bride, to share the scene at the end. We participate in the unseen realities of the future, and we participate in the unseen realities of the present. And what are those realities? See, behold, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. As encouraging as this sounds to us, it was even more so to its original readers. This is an echo and a culmination and a fulfillment of hundreds of years of expectations and hopes from prophets and other authors. In the third book of the Bible, Moses records God saying this in the book of Leviticus. God says, I will place my dwelling in your midst. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Hundreds of years later, the prophet Isaiah writes this about God. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. As they continue saying about God, for I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. Over hundreds of years in different places, through different people, different prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, God repeats this promise again and again and again. And this promise comes to fruition in our passage today. In Ezekiel, he says, my dwelling place shall be over them, and I will be their God, they shall be my people. Jesus proclaims in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. All those hopes realized in this vision of the revelation. Every tear wiped away. Death, no more. Mourning and crying and pain, no more. God himself dwelling with his people. No, that's wrong. Um, all those verses from Leviticus and prophets say God will be dwelling with his people, singular, one people group. But if we can pull up that slide again from Ve Revelation 21.3, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. Peoples, a group of peoples, plural. I wasn't born Jewish. I wasn't born into the nation of Israel. Uh, not a lot of us here were. And in this vision, God is dwelling not with just one nation, one chosen people. His love is offered to all peoples, not just Israel, not just First Prez, all peoples. In light of this vision of the unseen realities of the future and the unseen realities of the present, so what? What does it mean for us now? Last week, Pastor Steve preached about Jesus healing a man with leprosy and how God rewrites our story. And when Jesus heals the man, it was actually step four of four. Jesus notices the man. And then he has compassion for the man. And then he touches the man. And then Jesus heals the man. 
And we may not be able to heal like Jesus, but we can do the first three. We can notice and we can have compassion and we can be present and extend a hand and a touch. We can hope for the future and we can work for that future in the present. We can hope for that future in the present and we can join God in his work of restoration happening even now. I want to show you a clip from the program 60 Minutes about a nurse on Mercy Ships, uh, which is a Christian nonprofit that is essentially just a big hospital on a boat. Um, the ship travels around West Africa and it provides healthcare, free healthcare for those in need, um, particularly surgery for cleft palates and benign tumors, cataracts. They literally give sight to the blind. And the, noc- and the doctors and nurses and staff all on this boat are all Christians. And they are not paid. They pay their own way to provide health care to those in need by raising support like missionaries. And in this clip, the patient you'll see has a benign tumor. And it looks horrific. Um, but it's actually just tooth enamel that didn't stop growing. Uh, in the US, a dentist would take care of this long before it became a problem. But in places without regular access to health care, it becomes a disfiguring tumor. And you'll see this clip, it's a 15 minute, 60 minutes clip. I'm only gonna show you about, you know, less than two minutes. I'm gonna show you a clip about this nurse. And what this nurse does, I think is something we all can do. Uh, We can't all provide healthcare in a floating hospital, but what we can do is we can radiate and communicate God's love to people and his plans for restoration. Please roll the clip. Ali Chandra is from New Jersey. You know, you could be a nurse anywhere. You could be a nurse back home. I wonder why you do this work. I could never be a nurse back home anymore. I could never go back. There's just this sense of real community that I would really, really miss if I ever left. One of her jobs in this community is to care for the sickest patients. You're all right, baby. You're all right. This is Esther, another one of the tumor patients, as her breathing tube was being removed. Okay. Esther's tumor was massive and her recovery a desperate struggle. Hey, I hear your voice. I hear your voice. You can talk to us. That's so good. Esther could not understand the language, but the touch was unmistakable. Good job, sweetheart. You You know that there are some people watching this interview who are saying to themselves, I could never do what she does. Those four (laughs) people are terribly disfigured. Mm -hmm. I can't look at them. People have been saying that to these people their whole lives. And someone has to look at them. Someone has to look them in the eye and tell them that you're human and I recognize that in you. And it's really interesting when, sorry, when new nurses come a lot of the times, they're, they're very shocked and you can tell that this is, you know, I, and you remember that, oh yeah, the first time I saw that, that was kind of shocking, but you, it gets to the point where you don't, you don't see it anymore. You don't see the tumor, you just can see the person's eyes or if they only have one eye because the other one is a tumor. You find their eye and you find a way to connect with them. I was so moved by the nurse's words. And she does what Jesus does. She's present, she notices, she has compassion, she touches. I hear your voice, the nurse says. The touch is unmistakable. And she explains, you find their eye and you find a way to connect with them. I think in doing these simple things with the people around us, we lift the cover, we open the door, we reveal behind what's behind the curtain, we unveil what is hidden. We will participate in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The last passage in our passage today reads, then he said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The unveiling, the revelation is of a person. The title of the last book of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. Samaritans were the historical enemy of the Jews. And Jesus offers her living water. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. 
The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Are you thirsty today? Do you, do you know anyone who is thirsty today? To the thirsty, Jesus offers water, living water, as a gift from the spring of the water of life, the free gift of eternal life offered today and every day to all peoples until the complete arrival of the new heaven and the new earth and the holy city comes down from heaven to our restored earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. You please join me now in prayer. God, we give you praise and we give you glory. You are God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And you offer us the free gift of eternal life. You are in the work of not just redemption and salvation, you're in the work of restoration. And you invite us into that work. You invite us to join with you, praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we pray, God, that you work through us, that we might be present to those in our lives, that we might hear their voices, that we might extend a touch, that we might find their eye and find a way to connect. God, may you lead us. May we join you in the work that you are doing in the world. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And all God's children say, amen. And, uh, now, please receive this final blessing. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Darkness tremble.